There we go. Okay, threads and concurrency. And this is a set of slides that I used to use for when I back when I taught IDS 401 a few years ago. Anyway, so there it is. Now, operating systems, as we know, can run many simultaneous applications, right? But they're not truly simultaneous. So one thing, if you have a multi-core machine, and most computers these days are multi-core, then each of those cores is a separate CPU and can run an application separately. However, once you exceed more than one program for, per CPU, which generally happens quite quickly, then time has to be divided among them by something called time slicing, which basically means you want run one application for a few milliseconds and another application for a few milliseconds. They take turns. Java essentially uses these same kind of techniques to allow applications to run par in parallel. For example, you can have timers for clocks or for animation. Uh, you can have separate uh, input output streams for things like audio and video and any sort of multi user applications. Basically, that sort of whatever they're doing, they're going to take turns doing it. So that's that's the issue and multi threading just like your operating system can manage multiple applications at the same time. Well, your Java virtual machine can manage multiple application threads right multiple execution sequences in a program and does them in parallel in the same way the difference with java java is generally going to confine those uh, applications uh, all those application threads to a single core it's just uh, the system is geared that way so that can create some interesting troubles in fact i'll open up with uh, a case of that so this is a little frame thing i've been working on for some application stuff i'll eventually implement timers on wednesday but right now we have a very simple frame, right? So there's a yellow ball and it flies across the blue screen when I hit start, but unfortunately, it looks flickery and terrible. Okay, but I'll show you something quick on there. So when I run it, because these windows are basically a single thread environment, I, if I'm running one thread to move this ball along using the timer, it blocks the other thread that might be waiting to listen to these other buttons. So for example, if I do start and then try to hit exit quick, it ignores it. But then once that thread is done, right, this is finished because the ball moves off the screen, then the system says, oh, now I heard what you were saying. Now I caught up and it exits. So anyway, there's ways around that, but we'll get to that on Friday. All right. An application, when you, you know, when you double click on that icon in Windows or something, it's basically a single code entity, right? You have a single access point to get it started and get started and that's great and it runs. But an application might in fact be a set of separate programs. For example, internet browsers, they often have a bunch of separate things going on. For example, if you have separate tabs, each of those tabs is in a way a separate application, right? Because you can be running different web apps on each page. Likewise, anytime you have an advanced video game, you might have one uh, sub application for graphics, a physics engine in there to show how objects interact within the game world. Uh, you might have an artificial intelligence agent uh, engine inside. So again, whether you call it a single application or a set of modular related applications, is sort of splitting hairs. The point is, if they're all off doing different things, then in parallel, they're going to need to act like they're separate applications. So, same thing for Java. In Java, you have a, a distinction between a process and a thread. Okay, a process is what we would consider an application. So, a process owns and operates at least one, possibly many threads. A thread is an execution sequence. Now, the key difference is, a process has its own uh, allocated memory space. For example, if we were to dig into the advanced stuff in Java, we could get into our run configuration and in the arguments tab, we could set up some virtual machine arguments that would reserve a specific amount of memory for our program to run in. And that would be allocated over the entire program. However, when you have individual threads, you don't act allocate memory to them separately. Java does it automatically. So that's the real difference. Processes and threads, in a way they're both applications, but a process could be a group of threads. And in order to achieve that, it has to have its own pool of memory that it allocates to all the threads as they're needed. Okay. Now, 
How do we create a process? Well, anytime you tell Java to start an application, the corresponding process automatically gets created, right? So you click that start button on an application or that run button, boom, it starts going. Java behind the scenes creates the process. Launching that process also creates the main execution thread. So if you ever wondered why the method is called the main method, well, that's because it corresponds to the main thread of the program, right? So the initial process launches a single thread off of main. And if you like, and as the program is running, you can uh, spawn additional threads off of that main thread, okay? So that's why, that's why it's called the main method, because it's the main thread. Now, thread is a standard Java class, so it's there, it's part of the Java language, java.lang.thread, so you don't have to do any imports, it's just there for you. And there's two essential methods in thread. The first one is start. Start is the method that you call to begin executing the thread, Run is the other method, and you call that to actually execute the code of the thread. So whatever that thread is supposed to do, that's in the run method. And the start method is what you do to launch that thread. Anyway, uh, so threads can be used in two different ways. You can either use the interface, the runnable interface. In most cases, this is the way you want to go. You don't usually need to create your class as a subclass of thread. There's nothing wrong with doing that, except that in that case, you won't be able to inherit from any other classes. For example, if you have a frame that you want to run applications in and you make it a subclass of thread, you won't have access to all of those, you know, frame components immediately. Anyway, but you can make it work either way. So there's an interface called runnable that lets you use the uh, start and run methods. And of course, you can make a subclass of thread, and then it'll have its own start and run methods that you can override. All right, now in order to create a new thread, it's very simple. You first create the thread object, and then you call it start method. And whatever code is supposed to run should already be there in the run method. Now, once a thread is created, it runs to completion unless it's governing process end. So if you tell it to run, it's gonna call that run method, and then it's going to keep doing stuff as it needs to. Now, your typical computers, they can support a whole lot of threads, as long as they're not too demanding. If they're not doing any really heavy-duty graphics uh, processing or long lists of number crunching. Yeah, you can usually have a whole bunch of threads going on, and it's not too much trouble. However, as a rule of thumb, it is a good idea to avoid letting your threads create other threads, because then the number of threads could potentially spiral out of control. If you just say, well, within my one, you know, main method, within my main thread, from there as needed, I can spawn off new threads. That gives you a way to regulate it a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very quick example here. This is uh, the same code that's here on the next slide. And we're fun with threads. Okay, so very simple class here. It implements the runnable interface. In the main method, I'm going to start off with this and get rid of this while true. And what I'm going to do here, I have a new thread and I'm going to start it and then it's going to print out the thread is done. Okay. Also, it's going to call the run method. So what should happen if we look at this sequentially, we should see, ah, I call the start method. That's great. Start is going to transfer control over to run. This is going to do its thing and then it's going to return back to here. Okay, sounds good. That's how that should happen. So let's run it. There it is, the thread is done, the thread is running. Okay, now if I do it this way though, if I create a whole bunch of threads, basically as fast as Java can make them, then there's gonna be a bit of an issue, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, if you look at this, you can see I have some doubles, all right? These are probably going to be from alternate threads crossing in with each other. So what we'll have, I don't know what's going on outside my house, but it's pretty loud. All right, so we have the start method, right? Which you can see in the code says the thread is done, which should happen after run, run prints, the thread is running, 
and then returns to start, start prints, the thread is done, okay? But if I have two threads doing this, what can often happen is I have multiple threads running in parallel and uh, they're not strictly organized. So I could have one thread that looks like this, another one that, you know, you would think they would all go in turn, right? Or they would all go, whoop, or they would all go something like that. They would all go sequentially. But in fact, they can often look more like this. They can look, one goes here and one is starting while the other one is still running. And then this one has started a little bit and something like that. And so I can get some weird effects that if I have a whole bunch of different threads, they're not going to be all absolutely sequential unless I use a special method to make that happen. We'll see in a moment. Okay. Now, sometimes you want to pause your thread, right? You want to say, ah, oh, this thread isn't doing anything for a while. So I'm going to let one thread stop. So it's not just, you know, cycling constantly and eating up CPU cycles. I can stop it so the other threads can do their thing. So Java has a sleep method for that. You can use that, uh, uh, do it in milliseconds or nanoseconds. And these are approximate times. So, you know, you don't want to do any precision stuff with it, but you know, it'll, it'll be pretty close. And also these timers and threads might be interrupted. So let me give you an example of this. I have in this, uh, my T-frame class, for example, I could do this as a, uh, where's my, yeah, I was doing this as a sleep. I don't know why I took out the sleep. Okay. Where is it? Oh yeah, I gotta do the try catch. Uh, this is something I'll explain in a moment. Okay, so within my application, this is the sleep, so I'm going to pause it for 50 seconds and I can control how fast the things happen by controlling the length of that sleep cycle. Then, I have to embed this in what's called a try catch block because problems can happen basically. I have to have some method of recovering in case the thread gets interrupted. So that, that's what I'm doing here. We'll cover exception handling a little later in the course. Anyway, so if I run this and I hit start, I can regulate the time. Unfortunately, as again, because I'm operating in this one thread and these windows are a single threaded environment, it's going to ignore me until that ball reaches all the way to the end. I can't even do this window stuff at the end. Nothing's, nothing's working to shut this down. However, I can take it out to the uh, console, shut it down that way. Okay, if I want to have things happen faster, for example, I could set the uh, sleep time to be 10 milliseconds, and then it'll zip along much faster. So there it goes, right? And I can wait a few seconds, and it'll hit the end and be done. There we go. And now because I reached that end, right? So while TPX, that's the X coordinate of that ball, as long as it's less than 800, it's going to be doing this. But once it hits the end there, it hits 800, this method is done and it ends. And then all my other window actions are available. Okay. So that's sleeping. Sleeping is pretty simple. Uh, there are interrupts. An interrupt is something that you can do to halt a thread. Uh, one method, one way you can do it is just call interrupt on that thread, but yeah, that, that's, we'll, we'll cover that a little later too. But if you need to, the key thing is if you need to stop a thread, you can. Also threads have an internal interrupt flag, basically a Boolean variable uh, that's going to be set to true when an interrupt occurs and set to false when uh, you read the interrupt status. So if you need in your program to look at why a thread is stopped, you can do that. So as, from the moment it stops, you can say, oh, give me that information about what stopped this process. Okay. Now, 
Suppose your main process is some kind of frame that contains animation and you want the animation to stop when the user clicks on some component, right? Structurally, the way you'd set this up, you could have the frame as your main thread and then that frame is going to spawn an animation thread and then the component will register the frame as the listener, okay? So when the user clicks on the component, the frame sends an interrupt to the thread. Uh, basically how that sort of thing happens. If, you know, again, you want this to stop. Now, because of these swing situations, again, you can't have multiple threads running for these kind of simple Java windows. However, what you can do is something called a timer object. A timer object will let you do multiple threads at the same time. I have a quick code example on timers here. This test one that I lifted off the internet, because I can do that. Let's see, I don't, I don't want a little separate window. I can do that. Okay. So this one, I'm gonna import the timer class from java.util. And basically, I have, I have my class here. So I have, I don't know, this is really weird and noisy. They're stomping around, there's noise outside. This is a bad day for lecturing. Okay, so for this one, what do I have? I have a timer object and a timer task that is uh, basically my thread thing that's gonna happen. So this guy, helper, right? Extends timer task. Well, timer task is basically a thread. And what else can I say about that? Uh, it has its run method. So whatever I want to do with that, you know, whatever's supposed to happen, it happens in the run. And synchronized we'll talk about in just a moment, but that basically makes sure that no two threads are accessing the same data at the same time. That's what synchronized means. Okay, so think of timer task as just a thread that's specific for this timer class. So anytime I want to do something with this timer, I could, for example, call schedule at fixed rate. Well, that method I can specify the task, which is a thread, and I can exp uh, mention some other object that I send along with it, and then the interval, right? So the interval is going to be uh, 5,000. So the reason why you need a date for this is you need to track the initial launch time for this timer. So whatever time it starts at, that's gonna be your time zero. And then at 5,000 millisecond intervals afterward, the task will keep repeating. So I can do this, I can run this, uh, there's a little bit more code down here, but basically what it does is it uh, tracks at five second intervals. You'll see the new stuff coming around, a couple seconds here, there it goes, there's two, and in another five seconds we'll see the timer ran three, and this particular one, it's gonna close out after four, it's gonna stop. There it goes, and then it terminated there, boom. Okay, if I wanted to have the intervals happen faster, I could set it at one, and if I wanted to, uh, you know, have it run for a full minute, do for 60 uh, repetitions of this one second interval, Again, these are not precise seconds. I mean, it's gonna be pretty close, but you can do some easy things with timers to prove to yourself that it doesn't always work the way you think it should work. Okay, so one of the problems that often happens is the slicing process is inherently, again, a little bit imprecise. And so every timer you would think, is, oh, each one gets its own slice of one millisecond. Yeah, it'll start off that way. And then one thread will just, for whatever reason, it'll get a little bit grabby and it'll take like two full milliseconds and the other timers will fall behind. You'll see if you run a bunch of timers in parallel, pretty quickly, they'll start getting a little bit out of sync. Okay. So, now one issue that happens with threads is you often want one thing to start immediately after another does, right? Or one thread is going to pause until another one completes. So in these cases, you can use a join method to make the, uh, whichever thread is calling the method, it, it pauses until the thread that it's calling finishes, right? So suppose you have two threads, A and B. If A calls B.join, that means A is joining itself to B and A, A is gonna wait for B to finish. And then once B is done, B will send the notification back to A, you know, behind the scenes in Java to let A resume. Okay. 
Another related concept, synchronization. So threads are in parallel more or less and they're managed by the Java virtual machine. Uh, if you're not super careful with this stuff, like we're doing like dinky stuff now where you know my program might have a couple of gigs of memory allocated and I'm not doing anything big that's gonna cause any problems. So at this scale, we're not gonna see it. But if you're doing large enterprise scale stuff, you can end up having uh, significant conflicts over scheduling, over memory use, your programs will hang up. Sometimes when programs hang up, they end up uh, timing out and failing. You don't want that in a business situation. So when you have a multiple threads accessing the same data, you have to have some sort of precedence model in there, right? This is uh, simple stuff like say for databases. Uh, you know, the big example that I always bring out is there was this uh, hack about five years ago, maybe six years ago now, a uh, Bitcoin hack. There was a data, uh, an exchange called the Poloniex exchange. And basically the hackers figured out that if they launched a bunch of simultaneous withdrawal requests into the system, the system wasn't geared up to deal with that. Uh, the requests would start getting processed and the bad guys would get their money before the, you know, before the system realized that, oh, these are a bunch of guys all trying to take money out of the same account and they're massively overdrawing it. So the hackers ended up stealing about $20 million worth of Bitcoin with that kind of attack. So this is a very serious thing potentially. So simil similar problems, just uh, more generally here. If you have different threads accessing the same data, then at the machine level, their different instru instructions can interleave. They can cross into each other like that. So we think when we run a Java program, you think, oh, add one to X. And then another statement says, add another thing to X. And another one says, add one more to X, right? And we think it's all very simple step by step. But in fact, the simple process of incrementing a variable through Java is actually a multi-step process. There's a few things going on in there because of the translation involved. So. If we have, for example, one thread that wants to add one to X, then multiply X by two, and another thread that wants to add two to X and then multiply it by three, it's possible that if you have these operations going on, you're not gonna get the first two actions done before the next thread starts. It's just, it's unpredictable. So this is a bit of, and we can verify this, right? We can run, uh, have some threads. Let's see, let's make a program that does some basic thready stuff. Having fun with threads too. We'll give the main method. Okay, so some of this we're gonna lift. We're just gonna lift uh, this. Oh, we already have that. Okay, we're just gonna lift this. We have it right there when we need it. Anytime we want to create a thread, I got to pull one of those parentheses. Okay, we're going to start a new thread. So this guy, we're going to give him the number int x and this the number int y. Okay, and both of these, when we start the program, we'll set them both to zero. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Now in our start and in our run, we can do something with that. Let's, uh, we'll say while whoop, true. Okay. So here we'll have uh, public void. I guess we don't really need to have them be public. I guess maybe it does because it's through thread. Uh, public void start. Okay, so start, we're gonna start the thread. Okay, so we're gonna call uh, run. And within run, let's do, uh, let's add one to X. And we'll see what happens. And then uh, we'll print out the results. All right, 
We'll see how this goes. We'll see, we'll see how long it takes us to fall apart. I'm borrowing this one from this other class. Oh, new tongue with threads too. That's why. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, did I not uh, runnable? How did I do that here? Yeah, I implement runnable. Okay. All right. There we go. So weirdly, even as I'm creating all these things, right, the numbers are holding steady. That's disturbing. Okay, uh, new funds. Okay, so let's do this. Let's make a uh, an old one. F on with threads. Two. F W T equals new on with threads. FWT. New phone with threads too. Well, what's going on here? Oh, the new thread. start. Okay. So you can see, look at that. One of them went a little bit off. Okay, so even though you would think, oh, this run method should operate as a, you know, single modular unit, and clearly most of the time it does, yeah, these things can get out of sync a little bit. How about that? Okay, so what I'm trying to say, you gotta be careful with threads uh, and you don't want to use them in places where there's mission critical data or you know financially sensitive data, unless you really know what you're doing. Because there's a lot of problems that can happen if some of these, you know, if you expect X and Y are always going to be equal, but it turns out they're not, yeah, good luck with that. Okay. Anyway, moving on a little bit. So we'll wrap this up. Uh, now, as a consequence of when that sort of interleaving happens, right, because clearly what happened since uh, I believe X was the bigger one, no, Y was, since Y was the bigger one, that's strange. That means we had one thread where X had not been incremented, but Y had been, right? So something really got a little bit out of whack there, right? It would make more sense. Yeah, maybe X got incremented an extra time since that one happens first, but something went off the rails a little bit, who knows? Okay. Anyway, consequence of interleaving, changes by, made by one thread, not inherently known to be immediately recognized by another. So that's a problem. So any t even though there might be some stuff going on in another thread, maybe this thread that's accessing that same data, right, accessing X and Y, maybe this one doesn't know about it yet. It, it's a weird situation. So there's a couple different methods where you can uh, enforce that. So uh, enforce that happens before. If you wanna make sure that one thread happens before another. So one way to do that, always if a method spawns a thread, its prior code has to happen before the thread begins executing. So if you have a method that partway through the code launches another thread, everything before that thread launch is definitely gonna happen first. So for example, right, if in my code here, I simply spawned a new thread in the run method, that would be really dangerous because it would be basically an unlimited spawning of threads. But if I tried to do that instead, right, instead of saying here, uh, 
new thread FWT start for everyone. Let's see how long it takes to crash the program on uh, memory running out. Okay. If at the end of that, I just launched a new thread, then there wouldn't be a problem. I guess this will be okay because there'll always be uh, one thread starting. Doesn't like that one, huh? Okay, so I'm just gonna start a new thread off of this one and let's see what happens. Yeah, it kind of ends there, okay. I'm not going to puzzle too much out of this. Clearly, something has uh, gone a little bit, a little bit awry. I could just call run. Let's see. No, they don't want to do that. Let's try to implement it in here. So we can do this. Uh, let's do. Uh, uh, well, I've made my point. I, I'm thinking of different ways I could do it, but then I'm thinking that they might they might also fail. So let's see. Yeah, let's just do this. new one that way. Yeah, there it ran out of memory the way I thought it would, but let's see. Let's see if the numbers are lined up. So, I don't know. It didn't increment anything. Okay. It didn't access. Oh, because I'm making a new, yeah, because I'm making a new object. Mm -hmm. What if I make these static? That ought to fix it. Now we're getting somewhere. No, good. Well, even though I'm doing multiple ones, it's not uh, playing along. Okay, well, I'm not going to puzzle with this uh, too much during lecture time. Let's just get things back to where they were. Okay. So anyway, threads are a little bit weird. Uh, what's the mechanism to solve this problem? Well, you have synchronization. So if you want to synchronize your thread methods, you can synchronize them by including the keyword synchronize in the header. So between the return type and the method name, you put the magic word synchronized. And when that method is synchronized, its execution won't interleave with another synchronized method for that object. Okay, and when it exits, any state changes it caused are immediately visible to other threads. So what happens is then Java is careful with that synchronized method. It's going to start and finish that method in one block. So other methods don't see some intermediate part of it. Now, rule of thumb in a good multi-threaded design, if you're using threads, make sure you access data only by synchronized methods. But we'll talk about there are some liveness issues with that, that basically in a variety of ways your machine may lock up. But as long as you're only accessing data through synchronized methods, you don't have this problem with multiple processes accessing the data in a basically in a different form. So again, some weird things can happen if you allow that kind of simultaneous access. Okay. So for example, right, I could call this method uh, public instead of run, I could having that, I could do a print method. Okay, so public void print. I'll put that stuff in there. So this run method could call print, and it's effectively gonna be the same thing, right? It's gonna print out that long list of numbers. They're eventually gonna get a little bit out of sync. Okay, but if I make this synchronize, hopefully that'll fix it. Strange. 
can't be public. Okay, well, it likes it there instead. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, we should go before the return type. I haven't done this uh, threading stuff in a little while, so a little rusty. And there we see the numbers are lined up, right? They're the exact same as they should be. Why? Because we synchronized the method. Aha, how about that? So again, that ensures that this whole process is executed as a single block and thus none of these numbers are ever gonna get out of whack with each other. Okay, so that's good. So again, uh, if you want to make sure that uh, not just the method, but you can also do individually synchronized statements. So for example, I can make a block within a method, synchronize this, right? And then say, here are the statements I'm gonna execute within that method, and I'm going to keep them synchronized. So for example, if instead of you know, having this, maybe I don't care that much about the printing aspect, I don't need to synchronize the entire method, but I could synchronize this block, right? And then again, these two statements will be synchronized. So they'll always both increase, but then I don't have to worry about synchronizing with the printing process. So again, same thing, if I look at this, I can see they're still coordinated, okay. So anyway, there's a couple ways to do it. The nice thing about synchronizing this method, uh, just statements within a method, is basically there's going to be, uh, your system will be more flexible. It'll be a little bit easier to manage. Otherwise, you know, you might have processes that are waiting for something to finish. If that process, like printing doesn't take that long, but if you're doing something in your system that takes maybe a little while, then there's gonna be some kind of, uh, well, the, your program will run a little bit more jittery, basically. But this stuff, just incrementing the two variables, that's like microseconds, so that's gonna be super fast. So synchronizing them is almost costless. Okay, so last we'll talk a bit about uh, the kind of problems that might arise in these multi-threaded environments, right? So one thread problem is where you have two or more threads blocking each other. So for example, you have thread A that's waiting for thread B to finish, and thread B that's waiting for A to finish. And if neither one of them can finish because they're waiting on the other, well, there you go. Now over here in uh, Oracle, they put up this nice little bit here about concurrency and deadlock. So deadlock is a situation where two or more threads are blocked forever waiting for each other, right? So this example here, Alphonse and Gaston are friends, great believers in courtesy. Strict rule of courtesy is that when you bow to a friend, you remain bowed until your friend has a chance to return the bow, okay? However, this does not account for the possibility that two friends might bow to each other at the same time. So if you are bowing and while you start going down to bow, right, then your body has already returned bow, then you both just stay there forever because why? You're both waiting for the other one. So this is the sort of thing that's happening in this uh, little application here. You can try it out if you want to, you can run it as a deadlock class and you'll see what's going on in there. Let's go ahead and do it. So I'm gonna lift that and make the class. Oops. Okay, so here we go, let's run it. And the short version is, they're both waiting. Alphonse says, Gaston is bowed to me. Gaston says, Alphonse is bowed to me. They're both waiting for each other to be done. The program is just stuck like that forever. Okay, because neither process can end. Okay, so you can, uh, we'll come back, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but basically we have two threads and they're both waiting for each other to finish. Anyway, another possibility, something called starvation. Uh, starvation happens when one thread can't do its stuff because another thread is eating up all the system resources. Okay, so 
suppose you have two users A and B that are using separate threads to access a shared data repository, right? So far, it makes sense. The threads are synchronized so that one person doesn't make changes that affect what the other person is doing. That makes sense. And because they're synchronized, you don't get simultaneous access. It's simply not possible, okay? However, the system has been designed that if there's a stream of queries coming in, it's gonna respond to them in the order in which they arrive. And basically, if one person has a bit of a backlog on the machine, it's gonna try to push through all of those queries for that person before it starts listening to anyone else. So, if user A sends in a long list of queries and there's no enforced system for pausing it, right, then basically A is going to be able to lock up the system, especially if A keeps adding new, injecting new queries into the system, yeah, so there'll always be a backlog, B will never get a chance to use it. You don't wanna lock people in a system environment like that. You don't wanna have one user be able to lock everyone else out. Related problem, something called live lock. Live lock happens when the system is trying to resolve a deadlock, but instead perpetuates it, right? And the conversational example of that, imagine if there are two people walking down a hall, I can't really do it in 2D here, two people walking down a hallway towards each other, right? Well, what happens? I'll draw it in paint. We know what happens, right? So here's the hallway and here's you. And here's the other person. Okay, And they're both walking down the hallway towards each other. Well, in this case, they're going to walk by. So let's move one of them over. In this case, they see each other, right? So what happens? Well, they say, oh, I better move off to the side. I don't want to bump into this person. So, and something like that. They both move over. And then once again, they're blocked. So they kind of giggle, right? And they say, oh, he he, we're blocked. Guess what? We better move back. So they move back and you know what's going to happen, right? They're in the same place as they were before. And they giggle and say, aha, we got to move back. So we've all experienced this at one time or another where we do the back and forth sideways dance with somebody until we eventually figure out how to get by. But in an automated system, right, until a human intervenes and says, oh, I see what's happening here. This is the problem, right? So for example, suppose you have two processes, well, I should say two threads, trying to access the same data in a system, but in a different order. Okay, so, so each thread starts, but can't finish. And eventually times out. Well, again, maybe the response to the timeout is to relaunch the thread in reverse order, basically to read the database fields in the opposite order. Well, what's gonna happen then? Of course, same thing, right? You have two threads, they're reading the data in the opposite order. They're still gonna find themselves in the situation where, oh, this other process has some of the data I need locked up and I have some of the data locked up that the other process needs. So again, they'll both time out. Now, you can say this sort of thing should not happen in a well-designed system, right? It's the sort of thing you don't want to have happen. Sure, but not all systems are well-designed. So people make mistakes, right? They don't think about these things. Sometimes happen. Okay, another possibility that we can do with threads to make sure that objects are thread safe is we can make them immutable. And that's a big part of why strings are immutable. You may remember from the early days, we talked about strings and we said strings are immutable. That means if I change the string, I actually have to create a new string object. I can't just, excuse me, can't just change that string's data while it's at the same place in memory. And that ensures that any time I change some data, 
I create a new reference for it, basically, that's referring to something entirely new. And that's a way of making objects more thread safe because it ensures that if I change something, there's going to be a new copy of it and other parts of the program won't be able to access that, won't be able to access that new copy of it. So immutability, again, once, it, once it's created, it can't be changed, although it can reference a different object. So any immutable object, as long as it's in its current memory location, it cannot be changed, okay? Similarly, I mean, you could achieve the same kind of thing with uh, constants, with numeric constants by using the final modifier. But if you're talking about a dynamic program where you want things to be able to change, then making them all constants isn't really a solution. Anyway, so how do you do this? Well, one thing, make all the data members final and private. So you've made everything in there constant and you can only access it through that object itself because they're all private. Then prevent access and modification to any object data members. That's one thing, okay? So in effect, when you look at this object, you return shadow copies. You just return basically an image of the object, not the object itself. And the last thing you can do, uh, give it, declare the class itself as final or give it a private constructor method. And instead of uh, creating the new object and having that able to use, what you do is you use what's called a factory method to get the new object instance. So I'll introduce that concept. But they explain it better than I do and it's not in the slide. So factory method Java. Okay, design pattern solves the problem of creating products without specifying their classes. So this here, right? Uh, you can create things without actually accessing the constructor directly. So it's kind of a kind of a neat thing. Anyway. We'll talk some more about some of this stuff Friday. I know this is a, this is a bit of an advanced topic. I'm just throwing in a whole bunch of stuff today in the time we have. Friday we'll come back. We'll actually do some neat stuff with multi-threading. We'll play around a little bit with animation and some other stuff, but uh, Hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight into what threading is all about. Okay, questions on any of this stuff? You have any questions? How's everybody? How y'all doing? Uh, I had a quick question in regards to the homework. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, part two C says a method named create that accepts two strings named last name and first name well, as parameters. Let me take parameters. a because I don't memorize these things. One second. Okay. Uh, Essentially, my question is, mm -hmm. uh, for 2C, it asks us to update the ID field. And I noticed that in part one, we have update last name, update first name, and then uh, up, uh, get last name, get first name, and get ID. Should we also create a update ID? I, I created an update ID and I used that to reference in 2C. Oh, well, you don't need that within the constructor. Uh, in general, uh, it's, a, it's a good practice. Uh, I'm just going to mention this and write it out. It is a good practice to only to not exit from the constructor method. Okay. So for the assignment, yes, you could potentially set fields by using the get and set methods, or not the get methods, but using the set methods but it's not a good practice. The reason is you have all sorts of uh, potential weirdness that could happen. If you exit the constructor method with your object fully created, then at that point you have the object, it's done, it's gonna work the way you think it's supposed to work. However, if you exit from the constructor method, then it's possible your object is not fully specified the way you want it to be and it creates potential for things to go wrong, basically because that object could potentially have interactions with other parts of the program that you didn't intend for it to happen. I mean, the, the dinky stuff we're doing here 
it's not really a, a big deal either way. But if you're doing, again, big enterprise grade stuff, then that's one of the things they try to be really careful about. Okay, so in the assignment to directly answer your question, uh, you don't need to access the, those update methods. Okay. Okay. But if yeah. I did, so if I did create like another field called uh, public void update, yeah, for the yeah. updating the ID, would it be wrong if I did get off my code to it run would properly? Not, it would not be wrong for this assignment, right? So you can you can do extra stuff want to as long as you've met the requirements. So you have latitude to do that. This one okay. says, right, you create it, you do this, fine, it's done, right? It's maybe not the best way to do it, but you met the requirements of the assignment. Okay, awesome. Thank you yep. so much. And we, we didn't really need any other, it says in the bottom, we didn't need any other uh, error checking in this assignment, right? Like we're just expected no, to assume. We'll, we'll cover all that in a few weeks a couple okay. weeks we'll do uh, exception handling and that will all be very interesting but for now yeah we don't have any of that so we're just supposed to be able to create an employee list the employee get first and get last and then exit yep so let's see what all the uh what are the methods yeah i mean as long as you can process these commands correctly right okay. that's what yep. there is all right Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem.